connecting investors, financial institutions, and businesses around the world. Luxembourg is a center of excellence for global finance. Recognized for its unique international financial expertise, Luxembourg is solution-driven, stable, and open to innovation. A pioneer and global leader in sustainable finance, we help build a better tomorrow today. An international financial center and a European capital. Luxembourg is an exceptional and welcoming place to work and live. Discover what we can do for you. Welcome to Focus On, bringing together financial industry experts of different horizons, sharing and discussing their insights. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome uh, to you who are switching in to watch this Focus On 2024. Before we talk about 2024, of course, uh, we must realize we come to the end of a year that has been difficult, to put it mildly and to say the least, with interest rate hikes and interest rates being maintained at relatively high levels, uh, stock markets going up and down, and uh, life in the financial industry being interesting, when in fact we probably all would want it to be a bit more boring. Um, to make sense of this and to try to see what is going to happen, what we can expect in the year to come, I am thrilled to be joined by uh, three experts, three people with a very good understanding of uh, the finance industry from obviously very different angles. The first one will be Karen Ward, the Chief Market Strategist uh, for Europe, uh, Middle East and Africa at JP Morgan Asset Management. The second is no unknown face here on our programs. It is Pierre Gramenia, Managing Director of the European Stability Mechanism and formerly the Luxembourg Finance Minister for eight years. And to round it off, we will talk to Isabella Kaminski, Senior Finance Editor at Politico, about what is cooking in Brussels on the legislative side. Let us start, ladies and gentlemen, with the first part, uh, talk, me talking to uh, Karen Ward from JP Morgan Asset Management. I am very happy to be joined today for the first part of our look into 2024 by Karen Ward. Karen is Managing Director and Chief Market Strategist for uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa at JP Morgan Asset Management. She started her career at the Bank of England, uh, then worked for a decade at uh, HSBC, where she lastly was the chief economist for Europe, and before she then went on to serve as the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors for the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And in 2017, Karen joined JP Morgan for her current position, in which she will share her views with us today. Karen, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you. It's good to join you. Let's before we start uh, looking at 2024, let's have a maybe a look back on 2023 and hear from you what lessons you draw from this year, how you see what happened in uh, the course of the last 12 months. Well, I think it's been a year which has demonstrated how hard it is to forecast economies. We came into the beginning of the year with most forecasters expecting US recession. And it simply hasn't happened. It was the recession that was predicted that never happened. And the reason it was predicted so widely across um, all forecasters, including the Federal Reserve themselves, is that they we've just seen the most dramatic synchronized 
rate hiking cycle in the last four decades. And usually when the central banks slam on the brakes, we see problems um, in the economy. Usually shows up in different areas of the economy, but generally um, such aggressive interest rate hikes cause a recession. And hence we saw the rate hikes and everybody expected the recession. Now, didn't happen. So it's created all of these um, interesting theories. Is it just delayed? Does it mean we have problems that's still coming? Or is actually the health of our economies just fundamentally improved from what we experienced over the last decade? Is it that the private sector isn't hurt by interest rates anymore? Uh, are we just more resilient uh, across the Western world to higher interest rates? Is that a possibility? Is it because fiscal policy is much more expansive today than it was five or six years ago? And so um, that's a real support to economic growth in the way that we didn't see for much of the last decade. So I would say it, it's been a year of humility for forecasters, um, a year of head scratching. And certainly I think it, 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 it's really important understanding and some of those questions that I was just and those theories that I was just highlighting for thinking about what happens next year. And in particular, whether all of that weakness that was expected is still yet to come. So let's exactly uh, address those questions that you rightly ask. And in particular, the last one, let me ask you, are you optimistic for 2024? Are we going to uh, still be resilient, as you said? Mm. I'm a little cautious, I would say. Um, you often hear the central bankers around the world say that monetary policy works with long and variable lags. And every cycle is different. And consumers change their behavior and react to higher interest rates, and corporates also, at, at different times in, in each cycle. And I think what's happened over the course of this year and part of that resilience is that consumers had a lot of pent up savings from the pandemic. We were forced to stay at home for two years. We were forced to save. And therefore, when this year, even though interest rates were rising, um, we had that savings to uh, to, to, to run down, and that supported consumer spending, particularly in the US, um, where really it has been the strength of consumer spending that's been so surprising. I mean, the other aspect is this role of interest rates and whether interest rates still bite anymore. And the US uh, uh, household sector, they did do a good job of fixing themselves on low interest rates. Back in the pandemic, in the US, you could get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage for 2.7%. And a lot of people did. And so they haven't cared what the Fed has been doing this year. They are not impacted. They're not going to be impacted unless they move. So, so there is a degree of resilience or, or, or a slower pass through of interest rates, I would say this time around. But I think we have to be a little bit careful with the idea that interest rates don't have an effect anymore. Because if we look at consumer credit cards, if we look at auto loans, the payments on those have increased very substantially over the last couple of quarters. So I think the interest rate impact is delayed this cycle rather than completely diminished. And I think now that consumers are running out of their savings, they are facing increasingly those higher interest rates and companies as well. Then we start to see a little bit of that moderation in spending a little bit of knuckling down, and that does lead us to a weaker trajectory for next year. I certainly don't think we've been through the worst, sadly. So you are not optimistic, if I understand that correctly. Uh, what is it that you're actually most concerned about? You obviously mentioned uh, interest rates, um, the macroeconomy in general, the, the, the risk, the looming risk of recessions. Or is it also maybe geopolitics or could it be other factors such as government debt and the return of uh, debt crises as we have known them 10 years ago? The latter is actually one that I'm not terribly concerned about. I mean, I do think the Eurozone really thrives in periods of adversity. 
And in the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Europe has come together and I would say really improved the institutional architecture of the region. And establishing the EU Recovery Fund, in my view, was an enormous step forward in fixing what was the fundamental flaw of the Eurozone project, which was a monetary union without a fiscal union. Well, we in, in the sovereign crisis. Yet. I mean, we have we're made not progress. There. We're, but, we're, but we're baby steps. Yeah, we will talk um, uh, afterwards with Pierre Gramenia, the managing director of the uh, European Stability Mechanism. Uh, uh, he will be our second guest for this program. And so he will certainly also address this and be very happy to hear what you just said. It's, it's a sign to international investors that at least it's, it's on the horizon. Because I think back in 2012 and 2013, that fundamental flaw of having a monetary union without any kind of fiscal club whatsoever, that was really what was exposed. And I think the recovery fund, if, if that, if it is demonstrated that, you know, this is the first incremental step towards some kind of common fiscal policy and some unity, then I think it's, it's changed to me dramatically the architecture of the region. And I think, um, significantly changed the, the 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 sovereign risks but also the political dynamics in europe so no, I, I, hope, I hope he agrees there, with me when... this is not probably not going to be the hamiltonian moment that uh, uh, some may like it to be uh, if you look at german politics and also for instance what happened in the netherlands recently that is not going to work in favor of it but so, so absolutely, it's not as if all populist pressures have been removed from Europe at all. But I think with regards to the role of the single currency in some of those populist pressures, I do think it's a significant step forward. So we'll hear from your other guest with whether he agrees. But my interpretation as an external um, global investor is that this is a meaningful step forward. So of the things I'm concerned about, it's actually relatively low down my list. Now, as you say, there's an awful lot of other political events that are going to happen next year. In fact, we've got elections in four of the five biggest population economies in the world next year. Um, and, and it is really important that we, we see outcomes from those elections with leaders who are working together collectively with other leaders. Um, so that is, it, it is a, something I'll be highly focused on because we have some big structural um, problems in the world that we need to overcome, not least climate change. Um, and therefore having leaders that are, will be working together um, uh, and, and colluding on providing uh, solutions to those problems is absolutely essential. The more we see isolationist, protectionist policies, then it's going to make achieving um, timely and good uh, outcomes on some of these problems much more difficult. Yeah, if I may then tap your uh, knowledge on uh, the advice that you probably give investors and your own firm on growth in 2024, because so far you've been more on uh, the cautious, if not even the pessimistic side, but where do you actually see growth in 2024? And we, we can look at this from different angles. Maybe we should start with geographic markets. Where in around the world do you see growth that would be interesting for investors to look at? And then afterwards we can discuss assets or even the sectors, uh, the different sectors as such. Sure. So the US, I do see more moderate growth next year. The US, as I say, the consumers had their last hurrah. They um, uh, ha had this pent up savings. They've also been get, had a significant number of ongoing fiscal handouts, whether it was childcare subsidies, whether it was not having to repay student loans, and all of that is coming to, coming to an end. So I think the consumer is going to weaken in the US and you'll have this degree of reconvergence. Whether that means that the US actually goes into an outright recession isn't so entirely clear, but I definitely think we're looking at something much more moderate in the US. Here in Europe, 
I think we've had a great deal of our weakness already. I mean, the manufacturing sector has been in recession all year. Consumer spending here has been much weaker than in the US. So I think we have already um, experienced a great deal of the slowdown that was expected this year. So I don't expect things to materially weaken. In fact, there are arguments to say that even Europe could have a little bit of an upswing into 2024. And that comes from a few sources. One is for the consumer, you know, they've had a tremendous real wage squeeze. Inflation has been incredibly high. For many of us, our energy costs have quadrupled. It's been eye-watering pressure on households. And those pressures are easing now. Wage growth is still relatively elevated. And now headline inflation is falling back. So real wages start to improve for the consumer. And as I've already said, they, they haven't spent the pandemic savings. In fact, they've been continually accumulating more savings. So if confidence returns to the consumer sector, because the labor market is still very strong, then we could actually see consumer spending pick up. And the other thing, we talked about the EU recovery fund, which I think is a big institutional uh, step forward. But actually, very little of that money has so far been spent. Um, it's been much slower to actually get those projects enacted and get the work going. So a lot of that is still you know, pipeline growth support for the next couple of years. So I actually think we could see this reconvergence from the US and Europe with actually the US slowing and maybe even Europe bottoming and starting to pick up a little bit. Um, Europe will be helped if we see a recovery in China um, and broader Asia. Obviously, China has been another area of humility. I said that forecasters have had to experience this year because um, China was expected to have this big post-pandemic bounce back this year and it didn't happen. So I think the problems in the Chinese economy that stem from the property market have become more apparent. And I think, as I assess China, uh, Beijing is essentially, I would argue, struggling to work out what their new engine of growth is. They had a decade or two of very strong export driven growth. Then they've had a decade of incredibly strong investment growth and particularly investment in physical infrastructure and in property. But it's clear now those property, um, that property investment was perhaps a little excessive and is not going to be a source of future growth. So they now need a new engine. Now that engine will be the consumer. Um, and I have no doubt that they will get that engine going, but it's, it's difficult. It's harder to get, uh, it's harder to get consumer spending than it is to tell your local governments to go and build a whole load of towns. So I think how fast China does accelerate, I don't think we're gonna see great stimulus packages that we have in the past, I think China will be just more steadily improving, but when it does, and, and again, when consumer confidence returns there, that's going to help the European recovery also, but we may have to wait a little bit for that. So I think we've already seen a very desynchronized global cycle, and I think that will continue in 2024, and there will be areas that were formerly quite strong, like the US, who are maybe moderating but then also maybe some areas that are actually accelerating. Okay. Um, you mentioned the Chinese uh, real estate market. What about real estate in Europe, for instance? Isn't that mm. something that gives you cause for concern or do you think it will also um, fall back on its feet? Well, I think that there's, there's a lot going on in the real estate markets, both structurally and cyclically, and also very different across regions. So it's quite hard to talk generally, but I would say it, it's absolutely true that the real estate markets are one area in the global financial landscape that have really had to adjust to higher interest rates. Um, and, and it's been painful in some segments. We've already seen some quite notable price declines in certain areas, Sweden, the most obvious example where we've seen that adjustment to higher interest rates has been quite difficult, some quite meaningful price declines. And that overlays, particularly in the commercial real estate segment, some structural changes that are going on, particularly in regards to office space. 
uh, you and I are in our offices, maybe not everyone is back in their offices. So um, that those those high vacancy rates is still a problem for certain segments of the office space. So I think a lot of that pain has already been felt. Are we close to the bottom? I think in certain areas we are. Um, and uh, uh, but there will be others where I think it's going to be a long drawn out process as you know, we, we understand what the new normal is, because there's a lot of moving parts to this. Where do interest rates end up in the next two years? What is the return to office? Because that's all changing. So, so I think it's too early to necessarily call the bottom, but I also don't think it's going to get significantly worse from here. And what's, what other sectors are you particularly looking at for growth, um, for, for investments? I think that I there's, suppose, or... but I, I actually think some of the most interesting parts of the market are those that, you know, are, it's usually the ones we're not talking about. Everybody's talking about AI. Everybody's talking about technology. Um, and that's why their valuations are what they are. <laughs> it's never, it's never what you buy. It's what you pay for. I always remind myself. Um, and, and so actually I think it's some of the other areas where there's more pessimism. I think there's too much pessimism in European equities. If we look at every single sector, it trades at, um, a, at an above normal discount to the US. European equities always tra trade cheaper to the, new, to the US, but it's even more. We're at sort of record um, discounts on many European sectors. And I just, I'm not sure that's justified. I think there's too much pessimism about the European economy. Um, and therefore, as that some of that recovery that I spoke about or some of that reconvergence happens, you could see a little bit more appetite for, for European stocks. Um, and then I think in terms of specific sectors, it's some of the more traditional, more value-y parts of the market that I find most appealing. Um, I think financials, we are, we're out of negative interest rates. I don't think we're going to go back to negative interest rates. And therefore, the, the banks being up and to have normal interest rates and upwards to the sloping yield curves on average over the next 15 years, it makes the banks a much more compelling prospect than they've been for much of the last decade. So actually, I'm slightly more interested in some of the parts of the markets where um, there is a, a lot more pessimism that I actually think is perhaps not justified. And I think that also carries across to parts of the emerging world um, equity markets also. And where, do, where, where does, for instance, private equity fit into as an asset class? Uh, lots of observers, commentators are saying that uh, obviously it's struggling in an environment of higher interest rates given its uh, general leverage. Where do you see this? It has, of course, seen as its moment of glory with lower interest rates and uh, everybody wanted to uh, give uh, a larger audience uh, access to this asset class given its higher yields where do you see it going in 2024 i mean i think people rightly say not just for private equity but for many of the private markets when interest rates were low and we were all on a desperate search for yield a lot of money went to the private markets and so um, an adjustment process. Now we're back into normal interest rates. That is certainly playing through across the private markets. That being said, I think we have to remember there are some really structural reasons that many of these private markets are attractive. Um, now that might be because you can find inflation protection in things like core infrastructure that I can't get in public markets. Uh, with private equity, I think what the structural attraction is the fact that if you want high growth, new, exciting companies these days, you have to go to private equity because um, it's now on average 12 years that companies stay private before they IPO. That used to be four years. So it used to be that you could go to small cap public equities to get access to those exciting new emerging um, companies and, and and now what we see is that that small cap market is not performing in the way it is and i think that's because so many companies are staying private so the the best part of a com company's life journey if you want to access that you've got to you've got to get in early in the private market so yes there are some cyclical challenges but i think the structural underpinnings for why 
many investors were going to the private markets, they're still very much there. Karen, I could continue with you for hours uh, because I think there's still a lot to be discussed, but unfortunately we are slowly running out of time. And I want to ask you one, one last question, which is something that um, if we look back at 2023, we saw that there was some pushback, for instance, in the US, but not only, also in some parts of the European markets on sustainable finance. Now, I think I hope we would agree that uh, this is not only very important, it is rather existential. Um, how, how do you see this? Are you optimistic for the uh, development of sustainable finance? It had really taken up large parts of market share, whether it was in, uh, on the fund side, whether it was on capital markets and so on. Where do you see it going with uh, the pushback, the political situation in the US? Uh, is there nevertheless a big uptake from uh, investors? Well, I think the, the fundamental underpinnings for capital going to sustainable um, investing um, outlets is even greater than it's ever been, because now we have not only climate uh, objective, but we have an energy security objective. So our need to totally transition how we source and um, how we use energy is greater than ever. And we and our industry has to make sure that capital finds those solutions, finds those sources as quickly as possible. So the underlying imperative, particularly now obviously sustainable investing has many facets, but particularly on the energy transition, I think that the need is greater than ever. So with that regard, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Now, I think there's some things that can certainly be done to help the investor community in terms of how that, that savings meets the final projects and the right final projects. And we always say that, you know, data and transparency are absolutely critical. Things like greenwashing are the enemy of, um, of this very valid process because people lose faith and lose trust in the, in the process of what they're trying to achieve. So the more we can have transparency, and, and for us, that's about data. So whatever can happen with regards to, and there's some really positive things happening that the regulators are helping with, particularly on corporate disclosures, so people within my firm can really assess companies. What are they doing? Um, are they, do they have transition plans? How are they going to be affected? That really allows that um, efficient allocation of capital in this field. And I think brings a trust, a transparency and a credibility to the whole process. So I think all of that data and transparency is absolutely critical. And then I think the other thing is, of course, some degree, if at all possible, on global coordination, because we here in Europe can't do this on our own. Um, being wary of um, aligned standards, being wary of leakage, making sure as far as possible we've got partners working with us is going to be absolutely critical to not only reaching those final objectives, but for our own domestic economy and just not making sure that businesses don't head off to, to behave badly elsewhere. So it's a monumental task ahead, but I think, you know, we, I am optimistic because we have no choice but to, to, to reach this transition as fast as possible. Well, that is uh, one very good optimistic note on which uh, I like to finish this very fascinating conversation. Karen Ward, Chief uh, Market Strategist at JP Morgan for Europe, Middle East and Africa. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your insights. Uh, I hope you'll be back in Luxembourg uh, soon. I know you attend regularly Alfie conferences to speak, so it would be a, a pleasure to meet you in person. Thank you very much. Uh, wish you a good end of the year and a nice start into 2024. And I hope your optimism will be warranted. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you.
Welcome to the second part of our focus on 2024. And we will be discussing with Pierre Gramigna. Good Pierre morning. Gramigna, welcome. Pierre is the managing director of the European Stability Mechanism, actually current, uh, just celebrated his first anniversary in the job, yeah. which he started on uh, December 1st last year. Before that, for eight years, from 2013 until the end of 21, you were Luxembourg's finance minister and thus obviously also a very well-known speaker on our various uh, programs and events. We will be discussing with Pierre Garmenia um, a case for more Europe, and that is exactly what uh, we want to do here. But first, maybe, tell us a little bit, what is the European Stability Mechanism? What does it do? Well, the European Stability Mechanism was established in 2012. Before that, there was the EFSF as a transitional uh, organization, let's say, uh, which uh, uh, has become a very important institution, but which uh, started uh, when there was the general financial crisis and also the euro crisis. Uh, there was a, a lack in the European Monetary Union in the architecture of our Monetary Union because there was no lender of last resort specifically uh, for the euro area. Now, uh, when uh, certain countries were losing access to the financial markets, uh, one could have thought uh, of going to the International Monetary Fund, but uh, the means, the financial means of the IMF were not sufficient. And then all, so you could think that if you have a common currency, you should have your own uh, mechanism, your own European IMF, and that's what uh, DSM is. Since 2010, 11, we have uh, supported five countries, five countries, uh, uh, mainly, uh, so five countries meaning Ireland, Spain, Portugal, uh, Greece, uh, and Cyprus, uh, to the tune of 300,000 billion euro roughly. That means, and that explains how, how the ESM works. The ESM uh, has a paid-in capital of more than 80 billion euro, which uh, is the highest uh, paid-in capital of any international financial institution. And thanks to those 80 billion, which we keep and manage and have as guarantee, we can go on markets and uh, issue bonds for the countries we help. We are a AAA institution and thus we have a very low interest rate and the, the countries that we are supporting are then receiving the money from us at the AAA rate. And that's how we help them and also by having loads that have a long duration. So uh, that has uh, obviously nurtured uh, uh, financial stability and the five countries that I mentioned before today are doing quite well. In fact, they have among the highest uh, growth rates in the European Union because the, the lending they received came with uh, conditionality, with uh, structural reforms, which they did, and today uh, that pays out. And when you talk about them having the highest growth, that is, of course, in a general environment of relatively low growth. Uh, the ESM is born out of a crisis. Uh, we have gone now through a certain number of years of, of permanent crisis or poly crisis, as uh, it is called. How do you see the future? Where, what do you see in 2024? Are there concerns for you when you look at the European economy, whether it is uh, growth, as we just said, or government debt, or uh, many other factors? Uh, Nicholas, you're, you're completely right to highlight the fact that we live in, in a period of polycrisis or permacrisis, uh, certainly since uh, the pandemic. And uh, with uh, then uh, the uh, geopolitical uncertainty due to the war uh, of Russia uh, towards Ukraine and uh, with uh, the high inflation, I mean, we are in a difficult situation. And the fact that in 2023, uh, the European Union and the euro area uh, have escaped recession uh, is in itself a good result. Growth this year will be 2023 around 0.6% and more or less double next year in the last forecast of the Commission. 
So uh, this is good news. That this, uh, does that mean uh, that we can be complacent? Certainly uh, not. Uh, inflation uh, is still uh, far above the 2% goal of the ECB. This year, around 5%. Next year, 2024, around 3%. And probably 2025, slightly above 2%. Percent. So uh, we haven't won Close the fight. The target. Yes, that's the target of the ECB. So we haven't reached that yet. Uh, we have seen in the last months a, a slowdown, really, of uh, nominal inflation, headline inflation, as it's called, also because energy prices, fortunately, at the end of the year, have not gone up uh, too much. In fact, they have receded compared to last year because Europe has reduced its dependency uh, from Russia in particular and also had savings measures that are still uh, there. Uh, this being said, uh, this problem uh, will be with us for quite some time. And core inflation, uh, where you take out energy and food, for example, uh, is still stubbornly around 4%, and we must watch that. Uh, the other thing, the other risks, I think there are a few. I've mentioned inflation, which is probably for the time being more a short-term uh, uh, risk. But the other ones I see and that would, I would like to mention is that uh, the highest uncertainty now is geopolitical risks. And I've seen that at the IMF meeting in October uh, in Marrakesh, that that was the number one worry of all the countries. And, you know, financial markets do not like uh, uncertainty. So that will stay with us, hopefully, not too long. But nobody can really predict that. And, uh, you know, uncertainty, geopolitical risks, uh, add to the risk of deglobalization. Yeah. And that was the other topic uh, also at the IMF. International trade contributes less and less to the growth around the planet. And uh, Europe being a world champion of exports, together with China, where I was uh, not so long ago, in fact, last week, uh, if, uh, if uh, trade uh, decreases, it's not good for the growth of, of China and of Europe, but it is also not good for the growth of the planet because trade is a win-win and if trade goes down it's a lose-lose. Uh, third uh, risk I would like to mention is obviously climate risk, uh, which is one that's going to stay with us. Uh, COP uh, uh, Conference of Parties uh, 28 is taking place in Dubai as we speak and let's hope that uh, some additional measures would be taken multilaterally knowing that Europe has been a leader in this issue and, and is quite committed last. But not least uh, of the risk, I would like to mention something which uh, is hitting Europe maybe more than other areas of the world, which is aging population. With aging population, we have lots of issues. First, to finance our safety net, our pensions will be more difficult. Second, uh, with an aging population, your productivity is reduced. And, large, and largely, uh, more important even, is that uh, you need to spur innovation when you have an uh, aging population. Lots of issues connected to the aging population. And exactly on that point, how does that then reflect to, uh, on the um, perception that international investors have of Europe, of its markets, of its economies. Your job is to travel around the world and to sell European debt uh, that you still manage. Um, and in those discussions that you have, what is the impression that you get from the way that uh, major international investors are looking at Europe? I think that, uh, first of all, it's important to realize that we have 300 billion euro uh, that we have financed and are refinancing. Uh, this year and la uh, next year, we will issue 28 billion euro of uh, new bonds. Uh, and uh, investors are obviously following then the ESM and European uh, economy a lot, but also how we respond to the crisis as a uh, European Union. And I think markets are quite uh, impressed by, uh, by, by our record in the last two, three years because a lot of responses came at European level. Think of next generation EU, uh, which is a, a great act of solidarity and, and the package that was decided on uh, the 9th of April 2020 by finance ministers in terms of the short program of the Commission, uh, in terms of uh, the European Investment Bank, uh, guarantees for small and medium-sized enterprises, and also the pandemic crisis support that was announced by the ESM. So 
we have made a collective uh, answer, and that is uh, recognized and seen by markets, but that does by no means uh, uh, guarantee that we are completely uh, safe or uh, that we have nothing to do so in the future. So no complacency uh, uh, is uh, here um, obviously necessary. Let me uh, also say that uh, as we speak at the end of 2023, we have the discussion discussion of the economic governance review which is under uh, underway and where markets uh, expect uh, the European Union to find a solution in order to modernize the stability and growth pact. We have to learn the lessons uh, of the past in, in this context and we as uh, ESM follow that discussion. I sit uh, uh, at the Eurogroup and we will have meetings uh, in December and uh, uh, obviously uh, Markets expect that, but also our public um, uh, public interest, I mean the, the public out there, and uh, all governments uh, are eager to have a solution to this issue. That is uh, already a good transition into the next topic I would like to talk with you about, and that is what can or needs to be done in order to make the Eurozone more resilient. A lot has already been done, but there are still some uh, uh, initiatives to be taken and obviously there are also resistances. Yes, uh, continuing on the discussion uh, on the modernization of the Stability and Growth Pact, one lesson we have to learn from the past is that uh, the Stability and Growth Pact uh, was uh, not focusing enough on the need of public investment. In fact, the last 10-15 years, Europe has underinvested compared to the United States, compared to China and others. And so it was to a certain extent built in the system. So that's one of the major changes. The other one is that the new pact needs to be credible. Credible for governments, credible for public opinion and credible for markets. So that will help a lot. But uh, there's uh, quite a, a lot of other things that need to be done. Let me focus on two which is uh, completing the banking union. Now, the, the banking union has achieved a little bit more than half of what was the plan. First, um, we have agreed on a single supervision mechanism uh, of the major banks of Europe. That's done now by the European Central Bank, and that's working well. And in fact, the last stress test uh, of the banks showed that uh, the, the major banks of Europe uh, have improved their uh, uh, financial capacity and are robust. And in fact, when we look back of the financial turbulences that we have in 2023 in Switzerland uh, and in the United States, uh, we have uh, been unscathed uh, in the European Union, which shows that uh, the efforts in regulation uh, are uh, bearing fruit. The other one uh, is uh, the single resolution um, mechanism, uh, which is in place, uh, and that is a, a, a fund that of 80 billion that uh, has been collected from the banks themselves to solve the resolution of banks when banks fail in order to avoid to uh, having recourse to uh, taxpayers' money when banks fail. That's a great success. In fact, the ESM will add a safety net to those 80 billion, and that will be a, a new role that the ESM will play uh, quite soon as, uh, and in fact, when all the countries will have ratified the new treaty uh, of uh, the ESM. So that's quite good, uh, but we still do not have a European a deposit insurance system, a theme on which we need to work. Uh, and, and why is that so important? Because, in fact, the depth of financial uh, markets in Europe is far less in the, than in the United States. In other words, we still have a fragmented uh, picture there, and that's why we need to strengthen the capital markets uh, union. That uh, is exactly the topic uh, you're good. perfect in <laughs> teeing up the next topics uh, that we should also look at. Yes, yes the, capital the, markets union. Capital what, is, markets. what are your priorities in this? Everybody is talking about yes. the capital markets union. Everybody is saying how important it is to make progress in it. Uh, but I think that it seems to me everybody has something else at heart when they talk about capital markets union. From your point of view at the ESM, what would be uh, the main priorities there? 
Well, let, let's look at uh, the state of play, uh, meaning uh, how, uh, how, how important are financial markets, the stock exchange, available money out there uh, in Europe compared to the United States. In Europe, three quarters of the lending is done by banks. That's very good. Our banks are stronger and they play a key role. But only one quarter is done on, on financial markets through the stock exchange. And so we need to grow that part, not to the detriment of bank. We had to add up in that area. And why is it? Well, certainly because uh, the regulations uh, on our capital markets are not harmonized enough or very little. So we have there a fragmented picture. And uh, we need to work on that. We know that this is not uh, easy. We need to harmonize, uh, keeping into uh, account some national situations, but having much more, having much more common ground. Uh, so this is, I'd say, one of the main items we have to, to work on. I think the banking union, if we make progress there, we help uh, too. And uh, we, we need to attract more international players into Europe. And if it is too complicated for them, they will probably look for other places to invest. The uh, Capital Markets Union is also, I think, uh, one can say, seen by some as something that we need to do also to enhance the competitiveness of the European economy. Um, two former Italian prime ministers have been mandated uh, in, to write reports on this. What is it that you would uh, tell them to look at if... Uh, Yes, competitiveness is key. Uh, we have some good news uh, uh, recently in Europe since the last year is, for example, that unemployment has reached a record low level since the inception of the euro. Uh, employment rate and total employment is highest. But we have also noticed that uh, this has not increased productivity. That means the additional jobs are not adding also on top of it additional productivity. So we need to, to better use technology, artificial intelligence, uh, boost innovation, and not forget one thing. Uh, innovation cannot come mostly from government. Public investment is quite important, but we must see how we can crowd in private investment. And you see this feeds again in the discussion uh, of the capital markets union I was just uh, alluding to. Uh, when you see uh, other areas of the world, in particular the United States, uh, the United States in the last 20 years has had the highest productivity growth. Uh, we must inspire ourselves from the, the good uh, ideas that uh, they have produced there. I would suppose that that is also to some degree linked to their different risk appetite compared to European private investors. Uh, but that would be a discussion for another time. Uh, Pierre Gramenia, before we conclude, uh, let me ask you one final question on uh, 2024. Are you optimistic? Yes. You I always am. are. I am <laughs> always optimistic. Otherwise, I think I should choose different types of jobs than those that I've done. I mean, when you're an, a diplomat, a career diplomat. What makes you uh, optimistic? Then what makes me uh, optimistic is that uh, uh, we, we have proven as Europe, and that's the theme of this uh, uh, program, that Europe can make progress and even jumps uh, in quality when there is crisis. As we are in a polycrisis uh, situation, I am confident that we're going to find European answers because the national answers are not sufficient. That would be, I think, the first one. The second one is uh, when you see historically the weight of Europe uh, compared to China and to United States has diminished over the last decades. We need to catch up there in order to, to preserve our influence in the world. And I'm uh, pretty sure that our leaders uh, are ready for that. And the ESM is there to ensure financial stability. Yeah, but maybe let's hope that 2024 will not be another year of a major crisis because it's also a transition year in Brussels. We will have True. European elections that will then end uh, up in uh, the appointment of a new commission, uh, a new chair of the European Council. So let's hope that they will have a uh, more serene uh, transition period. Um, 
But, but if, I, if, if you allow a, a last remark, of course. we are there for financial stability. So some people think that the ESM is only useful when it has to help different countries uh, and, and support them financially. But we are like an insurance, like a fire insurance. Uh, it's important to have a fire insurance when your house burns down, but it's also good to have an insurance when your house doesn't burn. And I'm quite confident and I hope that uh, the, the, the economy will not burn and will make progress next year. Very good. On that uh, very optimistic note, Pierre Gramigna, a warm thank you to thank you, you for this very interesting discussion. Thanks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after discussing with Pierre Gramegna a case for more Europe, uh, let us continue with Europe and go into the thick of it with uh, somebody who's a very, very uh, savvy observer, of course, of everything that is happening in Brussels. And that is Isabella Kaminski, who is the senior finance editor at Politico. Everybody knows Politico, but maybe for those who are not so familiar with it. Maybe Isabella, welcome. Um, maybe you can say what Politico does and why people uh, should occasionally have a look at politico.com. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, I'm the senior finance editor at Politico Europe. Um, and I think for those who are not familiar with Politico, it's worth pointing out that it hails from the US, but Politico Europe was its own entity for a very long time um, until Axel Springer came in and swooped up um, the US arm in 2021 as well. Um, so we are now in the process of integrating the two arms, the US arm and the, um, the Brussels-based um, European arm. Uh, we also have satellite offices uh, around Europe and in the UK. And we have very ambitious plans for expansion in, in Europe. We are looking to go beyond just the Brussels bubble. We are investing heavily in London at the moment, um, especially on the financial services front. We hope to start a whole new um, offering uh, in the new year focused on coverage of, you know, very um, kind of minutiae coverage of uh, financial services affairs um, in the UK. Um, and beyond that, we've also launched uh, defense offerings this year. Um, and we have brought um, a dedicated central banking service amongst many other things. So yes, Politico likes to go into the weeds of what is happening in policy um, and really following legislation as it goes through the sort of organs of uh, of Parliament or um, the EU system, um, and we try to to provide that that insight that maybe isn't missed, that maybe isn't covered to the same detail by the more mainstream media. Great. Well, we certainly look forward to discussing with you what is happening in Brussels. Uh, for one, not from the point of view of a legislator or the point of view of uh, somebody who's making policy, but somebody who's an observer of it all uh, and a journalist. So let us maybe get started. And uh, the first question I would like to ask you is, if we take the overall context uh, with, of course, the war in Ukraine continuing, um, the conflict in Gaza, the uh, economic uh, gloom. What would you describe as the mood uh, around Rampoint Schumann and uh, Place de Luxembourg in Brussels? So I should point out um, that, as you can see from my background, I'm actually based in London. Um, when, whilst I um, go to Brussels um, and visit my colleagues and I interact with them all the time, I'm not there on the scene. However, um, my understanding is that at the moment, the best word to characterize the mood in, in Brussels is vigilant. Um, there is a quiet concern about the reemergence of crisis again, I think, especially on the energy front and whether we will be able to maintain um, the 
the sort of supply situation this winter um as as we all remember the the war in ukraine um f- through a, a big spanner in the works for for the whole of europe uh in 2022 and um and now we are um trying to to make ends well we're trying very much to did i say 2022 it was 2021 <laughs> um we are trying to to really look into into this winter and um and get through it in one piece um as so far you know it's it seems like inventories are well positioned and we will be able to cope. But if the winter is harsher than expected, I think that's really the point that um, thing, tensions might rise again. And obviously, there have been already uh, many sacrifices taken by European countries um, to to help fund both the, um, the defense of uh, Ukraine, but also to maintain the sanctions and to live up to the sanctions that were agreed. Um, Germany, I think, has been amongst the, the countries that has suffered the most in terms of um, uh, in terms of how its industrial um, element has had to kind of um, sacrifice cheap energy for the for the greater cause um and now with the fiscal um situation over there um most recently um discombobulated again because of uh the budgets not being approved <laughs> we are facing up to tensions i would say so any anything that would bring further upset on the energy front would be difficult to digest And as we have uh, seen, unfortunately, at the start of October, uh, surprises uh, can happen. Um, Isabella, let's take it to financial services and and have a look back. If we uh, look back over the last four years from the start of the mandate of this commission, one can only uh, judge, I think, uh, fairly that they have been extremely active on the legislative side with many different initiatives from uh, sustainable finance, both the taxonomy, SFDR, and many other pieces, um, to Mika, Dora, and, and many more. How is this viewed by your readers? Uh, do you do you get any feedback on what they think uh, of it? Is it judged positively? Are they um, in shock and awe from it? Or in terms of the sheer volume of uh, legislation, I mean, I think it's been a very busy uh, period for all our reporters. We've been, you know, closely following all the different um, initiatives as they move through the kind of uh, machine, the legislative machine of Brussels. Um, Our readers are often lobbyists. They're often um, members of parliament themselves. Uh, We we pride ourselves on being read by everybody. Um, And certainly, as you can see, we've expanded greatly into many new areas. So I think... um, that in itself is speaks to the to the busyness of of, of this commission's um, you know period in office, um, and in financial services, I think you know beyond the key, um, you know we we still have outstanding legislative files uh, that we're looking for. So we have completely we we have indeed completed some areas, um, but I think the next year is going to be defined by a scramble to get the last pieces into place. Um, Certainly, the capital markets union uh, side of things remains outstanding. We are now coming into a a small fight over euro clearing. Um, And I think beyond that, um, we've we've put Brexit to bed in a in a in a sort of compelling way. But um, whether or not we will get any equivalence decision coming up in the next year, um, remains to be seen, not least because of the uncertainty over in the UK with respect to the new or whether, whether I mean, chances are we will get a new government. So whether or not um, people will be keen to negotiate with the current one is is still still up in the air. 
Yeah, uh, we will come back to some of these topics, uh, capital markets union, of course, uh, Brexit for one, certainly. Um, let me ask you also about uh, one topic that has really, and it's linked to capital markets union, but not only, is competitiveness. It is seemingly becoming uh, one of the leading topics, uh, or at least a major topic in Brussels. Is this a recognition of uh, the fact that the EU has lost its edge and uh, needs to do something? Or how high should this be on the agenda of the next Commission? I think Europe is facing up to a um, sort of paradoxical situation on competitiveness because on one hand, we are hearing a lot about strategic autonomy and certainly in the aftermath of the um, you know, Ukraine war, we've seen the importance of, of reshoring and building resilience into the economic system. Um, and that doesn't stand, I mean, that, that sort of jars with competitiveness, especially on a global and international level. Um, it's competitiveness, but not as we know it, I would say, or as we have conventionally uh, known it. Um, so how do you stay competitive on the international market in, in, that, um, in that context? I think Euroclearing is a very good example of the um, other side of the competitiveness challenge, which is on one hand, um, you know, the Europe is supposed to be a sort of global standard bearer um, for all sorts of financial services. It's trying to show uh, path forwards in, in terms of best practice, but at the same time, um, you know, imposing uh, rules that force companies in Europe to hold accounts that European clearing uh, companies could be seen as uh, a slightly um, kind of uh, not in the spirit of competitiveness. Uh, why not compete based on uh, trying to woo companies to your shores rather than mandating them specifically to to hold your accounts? So I think um, this sort of paradox is something that we will we will have to face up to in the in the coming year. Um, and Europe is going to is going to really have to sell itself um, in a way that explains and justifies a more, um, I guess, closed approach to international commerce. Yeah, I think on the euro clearing, there are different views, and I'm <laughs> pretty confident you are. <laughs> You're quite aware of them also that uh, some on the European side will tell you that it's also a question of s not only sovereignty, but, but uh, risk management as such. Huh? Uh, but let's not go into that, that debate. Let's look at maybe forward. Um, you mentioned Euro clearing and many other things uh, in the context of next year's agenda. Next year is, of course, a very special year because we will have a European Parliament elections in uh, June then a new commission will be appointed somewhere around November and uh, start its new mandate on the 1st of January 25. Um, what can financial services professionals still expect happening in, is it only until May, until the European elections, uh, that, or is it not even that long? So what is it that we can expect happening over the course of uh, 2024 in uh, legislative and regulatory terms? Yeah, I mean, certainly 2024 um, being a sort of transition year is going to make it um, more difficult to get things through um, up until, I, th I think we've got up until sort of April really to push through it with Euro clearing and the um, a sort of decisive uh, proposition on AML, anti-money laundering um, rules and, and that framework. Um, certainly uh, there is going to have to be some decision made on where we will base the anti-money laundering authority, which may be a struggle in and of itself, um, as uh, it seems to be something that is um, not easily currently agreed on. Um, and then there's the fiscal rules, um, which apparently we're probably going to get a deal this week, um, but this would still have to go through the trilogue. Um, retail um, investment strategies, inducements, um, Basel III, 
Um, and on, on inducements, I think we're hearing rumors that if, if the ban on inducements is watered down even more, then they, they could remove it altogether. So these are, these are sort of um, a brief, a very sort of quick summary of the, of the issues that are still outstanding. And, and we will be looking to kind of keep an eye on uh, at least until April. Okay, that very much sounds like uh, DG FISMA is not yet going to put its feet on the table and uh, set out the clock. Anyway, they are probably already uh, starting to prepare for the next Commission's agenda. Um, ask you another question on a topic you already broached, which is, of course, Brexit. Um, one has the impression that, as you rightly said, probably, in Brussels, Brexit has been put to bed. Is Brexit even still a topic in Brussels versus the topic it obviously continue, continues to be in the UK? And what exactly do you think, from your vantage point, will the UK elections change in it, if either party wins? So I think uh, I think everybody is very much fed up with Brexit. So certainly what I'm hearing is um, it isn't top of the agenda in, in Brussels anymore. Um, this upcoming year is going to be the year where I think, if anything, we're going to be seeing that both sides come together to try and uh, become friends again, essentially. Um, we've seen some uh, departure already by the UK side. Um, obviously, we've had the... Edinburgh reforms, we've had um, the UK push ahead with its own view on the short selling disclosures. Um, and now, um, really, the big topic is going to be equivalence and whether or not, um, you know, the UK can be dubbed a, a equivalent market. Um, what are your expectations on that? So I think because of the new, because of the, <laughs> the uncertainty elections. on the UK yeah. political scene, there's going to be a reluctance to really put into put into shape any specific agreement until the new, until a new incoming government is is is, is sealed until that deal is sealed. So I think we'll be waiting to see, and there might be, you know, like I say. Tr friendly negotiations or not, you know, not so much negotiations, just like you know a thawing of the um, so far frosty relationship that has emerged post-Brexit. Um, but whether or not we get any concrete stuff, I very much doubt it. We we are expecting a, um, you know, a new government by the third quarter of um, next year. And we're not very sure when the election is going to be. Um, and who would want to kind of negotiate with the Tories at the moment? Um, I think everybody's waiting to see uh, the Labour government come in and, and face up to a um, discussion with Keir Starmer as opposed to Rishi Sunak. And don't forget that then we will get a new commission. So it will probably not be before 25. Anyway, I exactly. think what, it, what is important, what is good, is that we already made progress on, uh, as you said, thawing in the relations and stop this uh, uh, soundbite trading that has uh, characterized the relationship over the course of the last six, seven years, unfortunately. So um, with this, uh, dear Isabella, thank you very much for this very quick overview of what is cooking in Brussels. I think our audience is very interested, of course, what is uh, uh, coming their way from Brussels in terms of uh, regulation. And uh, we can obviously see that it's a, a transition year where a number of things need to be finished. Uh, you were very clear on this still being quite uh, a substantial number of files uh, in, in uh, the finishing throws. And then, of course, we will anticipate uh, quite another strong push by the new commission. Let's, let's see about that, OK? I wish you a very happy end of uh, the year, and I look forward to uh, seeing you in Brussels whenever I'm there next, or in London, as you are based in London. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Isabella Kaminski, the senior finance editor at uh, Politico.
Well, this brings us to the end of today's focus on 2024. I hope uh, you find it as enriching as I did to uh, discuss what happened in 23 and what we can expect to happen in the next 12 months. Pessimism, optimism, I don't know where you lie. I can see that uh, from, for instance, what Karen Ward has said, uh, I take it that, yes, we haven't come necessarily to the bottom of uh, uh, our difficulties, but as she also said, there's probably too much pessimism in the European economy and she expects there to... Uh, she expects to see more appetite for European stocks. And believe me, I think we could certainly use it. Uh, use it also to boost our competitiveness, which is definitely a topic that we will hear more about in the month to come. Ladies and gentlemen, it remains for me not only to thank our three speakers, um, thank you, the audience, for taking the time to watch this program, and thank our sponsors, Atos and uh, Elvinger Hoss Prussen, for their continued support of this uh, digital conference series. Thank you very much. It remains for me also to uh, invite you for the next edition of Focus On, which will take place on the 23rd of January, and it will be a focus on global competitiveness. As I said, a topic you will certainly hear more about in the month to come. Until then, I wish you a very happy, peaceful and healthy uh, end of the year, festive season and a new beginning to the year 2024. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.